Second. Super. Okay. Uh, we're we're going to get started here. Uh, before we get into the uh, main event, which will be awesome, as, as, uh, as you will learn soon, uh, we're going to have uh, Mary Widom and uh, Sid Hunt from the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and the Innovation Scholars Program tell you a little bit about that. So come on up. Hi. Thank you for coming. Any CMU sophomores in the room? Freshmen? First years? Anybody wish they were still Anybody open? wish, okay. <laughs> All right, fine. Well, any first years that you know, we have a wonderful program, Innovation Scholars. You apply as a CMU first year. You enter the, uh, sorry, as a sophomore. You enter the program as a junior. It's for junior and senior year, and Sid is one of our scholars. So maybe you'd like to say a couple of sentences. Sure. Thank Hi, you. everyone. So uh, I'm Sid Hunt. Uh, I'm a junior CS major here at DSES. And uh, I'm in the 2015 Innovation Scholars Cohort, and uh, the program's all about bringing together minds who want to put together companies. And every week we have a set of great speakers coming in and talk to us, advise us. Anything that we need to know, uh, everyone at the CIE, especially Dave, Mary, and Kit, they make sure that we get all the resources that we need to get a company going. All right. Awesome. Anything else, Mary? Great. All right, uh, so I look out into the crowd and I feel like I'm watching Cheers. We've got our Georges at the bar, but we've got some new faces here today, so that reference went over most of your heads. But there were a few smiles in the audience, so I know <laughs> they understood. Uh, my name is Dave Mowinney, and uh, with Lenore Blum, I'm co-founder, director of the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and uh, we're excited that you're coming and seeing these, these great Connects workshops. Uh, we always joke and say, if you come to these, um, you can get a, basically the equivalent of an entrepreneurship degree without ever having having gone to class or paying the exorbitant tuition rates that uh, we have here. Sorry about that, Dr. Suresh. Uh, so, uh, we're really, uh, it's, a, it's a great day when, when Sean Amirati can come and uh, share with a broader audience at Carnegie Mellon uh, his experiences and background. Uh, Sean and I go way back. Uh, uh, we were, in fact, roommates at one point in time, believe it or not. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a whole other story, but it's an interesting one. Uh, Sean has had an uh, uh, amazing career. Uh, he started off as a, uh, 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 a fellow here at Carnegie Mellon in the Software Industry Center way back in the day. And uh, uh, we're introduced by a mutual friend, and uh, I kept kicking his butt to become an entrepreneur because he was selling his soul to the man as a consultant. And uh, ultimately, he, did, uh, uh, he made the leap, and uh, we co-founded two companies together. Uh, they, uh, so we have a lot of experience uh, together. But there's a problem. Like, this is what success looks like, right? He's always wearing a tie, and this is what loser looks like. So I have, a, <laughs> I have a tradition of when guys show up wearing ties, I cut them off. And how many of you have been to my office? You, you actually have seen cut off ties. You've seen the office. ties, yeah. So um, should we do it today? I've been threatening to do this to him. Should we do this? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, Sean, it seems only will, fair. Will your wife kill me? No, uh, too nice of a tie. Uh, I, what, I'll, what I'll let you do is I'll let you take it home to Jen, and then if she says yes, you can bring cut it, it and bring it. And to we'll you. put it on okay. my trophy shelf okay. for the audience. So, I'm, I'm so, good for that. Uh, Sean has gone on to, to uh, also lead one of the leading internet media companies, Read Write Web, uh, which they sold to Say Media, and uh, has become a partner at the local venture capital firm Birchmere. So it's a it's a really great honor. Sean uh, donates a lot of his time, but we also have him on as adjunct faculty, so you, some of you may have the chance to take him in a course as well. So please welcome Sean Amirati. Thanks, Dave. I keep telling Dave that like some people are successful and some people have to try to fake it, um, which is why the ties keep showing up. Um, so anyway, so we've got uh, a little bit of time here today to jump in and talk about uh, building products and services uh, using agile development. Um, I'm going to try to leave time at the end for questions on whatever you were hoping to talk about. But I would also say, like, if there's things that I say or things that you're hoping to get that we're sort of hitting and not the right way, let's make this interactive, right? There's no reason uh, to wait to the end. Um, so this is sort of uh, a graph that should not be unique to anybody if you've been coming to these workshops, right? This is sort of um, what Eric Ries calls the flux capacitor of the lean startup, right? And at the end of the day, um, as Dave has probably 
uh, walk through with many of you guys and some of the lean stuff you've seen before. This is nothing new. This, this existed long before Eric um, wrote a book that sold a lot of copies to kind of uh, memorialize this, right? This is effectively the scientific method applied to innovation. And I think it's helpful whenever you're doing any of these um, talks to kind of contextualize what you're talking about against this build, measure, learn cycle, right? And so for today, we're going to spend 80% of our time talking about the build step, um, both kind of what you build and how you build it, um, and only hit sort of implicitly into the measure and learn piece of it. Um, but I think as you're thinking through this overall, right, you should be trying to contextualize the work that you're doing for the startups that you're working on or starting to think about working on against this. Um, the interesting thing is that th this workshop works out really well from one perspective, which is you'll end up spending probably 80% of your time figuring out what to build and building it, right? The measure and the learn from a calendar perspective are often much shorter cycles than the build part of it. So it does end up mapping back to the experiences uh, you may have in the startups that you do. Uh, but so the first part of this is then what do you build? And the second part of this is how do you build it? So let's start with this first question of what do you build, right? And so this is um, language right out of Eric's uh, book. Right, so Eric talks about uh, MVPs, and if you came to Dave Mawinney's workshop, you probably got like a really funny sports joke about MVPs, right? Or maybe it wasn't funny, but I'm told it's a really funny joke. Um, so anyways, right, but MVPs, right, this version of a product, and I'm, the brackets are mine, or services, which allow a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about their customers with the least amount of effort, right? So... This is how he defines MVP, right? And this is ultimately what you set out to build. Now, we're going to talk a little later about the choice of the word viable, um, but regardless of what semantics you want to use on it, that's what you should be setting out to build. And so um, there is no one-size-fits-all answer to what that is, but this question now of what do you build, I wanted to walk through kind of a number of quick examples of different answers that could be relevant early on in the, state, in the stage of your startup's development as sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, viable MVPs or sort of good, smart, early MVPs that we've seen um, both in the startups that Dave and I and, and that other people and I have done as well as the startups that we've invested in. So again, these are MVPs that are really early in your development, right? Ultimately, your MVP ultimately probably becomes your product uh, that you're selling into the market, but um, early on, um, these are kind of four examples that we've seen work really, really well. So storyboards, landing pages, demo videos, and then Wizard of Oz solutions, right? And so let's walk through each of those four uh, one at a time and talk about kind of the pros and the cons of it. Um, there, there is no order to these. Um, one of the things that I realized when I did this the last time is somebody emailed me afterwards and said, okay, so I started with a storyboard and then I was thinking I should go to a demo video, but I didn't, I had, I didn't know if I could skip the landing page step, right? Th this is not meant to be like a prescriptive, you know, you do one, then the next, then the one after that. Um, the question that you should ask yourself is, what am I trying to validate about my customers and which one of these or other techniques would allow me to validate that with the least amount of effort? These are just kind of four thought starters that get you kind of thinking about some things that you can do before setting out to build the whole version. So the first one of these is a storyboard, right? And, and let me tell you, so storyboards, right, are, are probably not new concepts to you. You've probably seen a movie or where you've seen maybe an ad guy pitch with a storyboard or for those of you who may have entertainment background, it's not a, a new term. The thing that I love most about storyboards is I have never met an entrepreneur who fell in love with their storyboard. That's not true about their product, but I've never met an entrepreneur fall in love with their storyboard, right? The, the act of creating a storyboard is so quick and intentionally so low fidelity and on a relative basis, low effort, that often entrepreneurs are much more receptive to getting the feedback from somebody on the idea because they haven't spent six months sleeping under their desk working on this problem before they showed it to somebody. Right? And so this ends up becoming a really interesting technique in these early phases to get feedback. 
And the key thing to it is the three words that are in yellow on the screen. So what you want to do with the storyboard is you want to start talking about how the customer, what the customer world is like before they pick up your product or service, and then what they do when they pick it up or during the use of it, and then what is their world like after. It also turns out that this is a great way to force people who fall in love with features or capabilities of what their technology can do to frame it in, from the perspective of a customer's benefit, right? Because thinking about what their world is like before, during, and after sort of forces you to think about not what's cool about the solution, but really what the problem is that it solves. And so you sketch out in a little sequence before, during, and after your product or service, and then it becomes this mirror that you take out to customers or potential customers. You show them what um, the, your idea is, and they are, they're encouraged to be more honest. Right? So I already made the joke about you not falling in love with it. But there's another element that's really important kind of early in when you're building these early MVPs that's important, which is it's actually really hard to get customers to be honest to you with you about the idea. You know, I think it's one thing that that we are particularly good at here at CMU. If you go sit down with Dave or Lenore or Kit and tell them about your idea, I think we've gotten very good as a university community at providing honest feedback to that, which I think is a, is a great benefit to CMU's entrepreneurial ecosystem. Here's the problem though, like the rest of the world thinks they're being nice by lying to you when you sit down to do that. And that risk goes up dramatically when they perceive you to have spent lots and lots of time working on your idea. And now you go to them and say, hey, what do you think about my idea? Most people are not quite as tactful as Dave Mawinney. And so they're, they're going to be compelled to tell you, you know, oh, it's pretty good. It's nice. There's some things that I like about it, right? And, and that's hard to get that kind of feedback cycle then. Um, and I think part of the thing that the CIA and the leadership here has sort of um, created into the culture that's good is like we actually understand something, right, which is telling you that your idea is a bad idea and to stop working on it is actually a very nice thing to do, right? But most humans don't know that, right? Most humans don't spend uh, a lot of their time um, giving feedback on startup ideas, so they don't actually know how to do this, right? But storyboards, I've found, almost anybody can give you honest feedback on because it doesn't feel that destructive, right? And, and the great thing about that feedback is the feedback also becomes a lot less binary. So you say, hey, here's the world before, during, and after the thing I'm working on, and they can tell you, well, that's kind of true, but how about you change it like this, which comes back to this point um, of it being a mirror, right? It's very easy for you to show somebody a mirror of what you think their world is like and them to tell you, actually, my world's not like that. It's more like this. And they don't perceive you to have spent six months on it. Whether you have or have not is a totally different question. I wouldn't volunteer that uh, up front in that customer interaction. Um, but so you can get this honest feedback. And then again, um, you're not going to fall in love with it, which is also really, really, really valuable, right? Falling in love with your idea is kind of a dangerous thing. I know that that's something that you've heard a lot um, already from, from people through these workshops. So that's not maybe a new point. Um, let me give you one example of this. And I think uh, you guys either have already gotten or will get a copy of the slides. So there's, uh, there's links at the bottom here. Um, these are, the next couple slides are slides that I stole uh, right out of a TurboTax presentation at South by Southwest. So TurboTax went and talked about how they used storyboards to build their mobile app, um, which I thought was a really, really interesting example of using storyboards because if you think about that company, right, they probably had a pretty good set of hypotheses around how people would want to use a mobile app for TurboTax. And I think as companies go, it would have been pretty easy to say, well, let's just build a first version of this and get some feedback on the app. But they actually did apply this discipline of, of building these storyboards, and they ended up figuring out that the original idea they had wasn't that good, but a tweak on it has created this mobile app that's actually done very, very well in the App Store. And so the next couple slides are from them. You can actually go through the entire presentation, and you can also find the audio, not the video, but the audio on the South by South web. South by Southwest website. 
um, for the presentation, so you could actually follow along if you want. It's about an hour, it's about an hour conversation and worth doing. Um, so they went out and they thought uh, something that I think would have made a lot of sense. It actually probably would have been my intuition if you'd asked me, like, what should a company like TurboTax do with mobile applications? Their intuition was, well, a lot of people are using uh, mobile devices as their first and only form of uh, information entry, shopping, lots of things are happening kind of mobile first, mobile dominated today. We should allow people to file their taxes on their phone. Well, it turns out when you go out and actually talk to people about that, people actually don't have that much interest doing that for their taxes because it's one of those things that actually the additional screen real estate becomes really helpful. So they went and they walked through this use case with people and then they said, you know what, turns out that's not the right problem, but there, here's this problem, which is I need to get information into my tax filing, right? So I have all these, these things. I may not have a scanner. I may not know what to do with this piece of information. Then I use my mobile app in combination with the website or with the um, desktop version of TurboTax, and that be, ended up becoming a very powerful application. And they got that feedback because they went out to people, they showed them the problem, they showed them the solution and then the benefit or what their world was like afterwards. They got real good confirmation on that and then they built, um, they built that application, worked out really well. So uh, an example of using a storyboard to get customer feedback kind of early on. So this is the first of these four different minimally awesome product ideas uh, that might be good early on in your company's development. The next one of these is landing pages. So a note on landing pages. Landing pages have sort of become the uh, de facto answer when you say to somebody, what's the first uh, MVP that you should build? I would say 80% of the entrepreneurs that I pitch with their, that pitch me, their first MVP is a landing page. And it makes a lot of sense, right? It's, it's relatively inexpensive. It's very easy to do. And there's a number of different things that you can get feedback on when you build a landing page and test it. I mean, the two most common ones that I see are testing different benefit statements to see which drives a higher conversion rate and understanding which groups of your customer segments end up being most likely to convert. Um, I'm seeing a couple inquisitive eyes. So just to quickly review how the landing page MVPs work, the idea is that you create a single page on the internet and then do pay-per-click advertising. So Facebook or Google typically, sometimes LinkedIn, sometimes Twitter, but usually Facebook or Google to drive relevant targeted traffic to that page. And then you, on that page, you know, have it be in private beta or a sign-up form that you tell them you're requesting invitations for or whatever. And you look at what the different conversion rates are for different pages. So maybe one set of benefits talks about how this allows you to do your job much faster than ever before, and another landing page talks about how it allows you to have much more precise or secure information than ever before, and you see which of those converts better, and that starts to give you a sense, okay, for this general problem space I'm interested in, maybe security is more important than saving time or vice versa, right? So that's the, that's the basic idea behind a landing page is that just, Maybe I'm misreading there, but is everybody good with that? Anybody have questions on that? Okay, cool. Um, some notes on this, though, that I think are important. Uh, one, like the number of landing pages I see that are just awful, like they're just poorly done landing pages, continues to amaze me, right? Because I'll have people who will spend like 10 grand on Facebook advertising drive to landing pages that are just not well done, right? And for less than $500, you can have a design, even if you're not good at design, you can have a designer build you a landing page, right? And we're going to talk a little bit later about the misconception of the word viable, but I think th this is an example of it for sure. Um, the other thing is that like, they just, they objectively aren't good landing pages from kind of a flow and a layout perspective. So some, some general comments on it, right? These are the kind of things that you want to make sure are all true about your landing pages, right? They should talk to the customer using similar language to the advertisement that drove them there, right? You need to have different language, different landing pages that talk about the benefits differently depending on what 
drove you there. Um, so if your ad talks all about saving time and you drive them to a landing page that talks about security, there is no signal in that data, right? That, that, doesn't, that doesn't help you at all. Um, and I, you, some people are smirking, but like, I literally had an entrepreneur in my office this morning who made this mistake. Like, it is shocking to me, right? They're like, people must care about this. And I said, well, show me the ad that drove it in because it just, it felt intellectually like the wrong conclusion to draw. And sometimes, and, and Dave can tell you this, sometimes that's just because I'm wrong. I'm actually wrong a lot wearing a tie. It's Dave's newest example of that, right? Um, but sometimes I'm wrong, but this one just, it just didn't seem, it just didn't seem right at all. And so, um, so we unpacked it and it turned out that like they'd only done one advertisement to drive to two different landing pages which talked about two distinct benefits but the ad that drove the person to that really only implied one of the two benefits right well of course the conversion rate was better on the one where there was a consistent benefit between the ad and the landing page Everybody else had not clicked, or most of the people had not clicked on the ad if they were looking for the other benefit, right? Um, another thing that kind of drives me crazy when people use this technique is they'll put all kinds of navigation across the top of a landing page so that you can click all over the site. Well, you're not trying to activate these as customers. You're trying to see if they'll fill out your form and request more information or not. So like a couple buttons, all of which drive you to filling out the form, or submitting the form are what you're looking for, um, right? So they should be conversion focused. Um, and, and then you should make sure you can actually run the measurements you're looking to measure, right? So whether that's Google Website Optimizer or you want to pay for a tool like Optimizely or whatever, like you should be making sure you're actually tracking this. Um, so uh, a couple tools that I usually mention at this point, I believe it's worth the money to pay Optimizely to give you the sort of simple a B testing stuff, make sure it's all statistically significant, well done, that you don't introduce bias into the, the A B test you're trying to build yourself. Right? It's just it, I realize all of you are good engineers. You could build that yourself, but this is like fifty dollars a month. If your time's not worth the fifty dollars, then um, I think you need to kind of reevaluate what your time's worth. If you're not a designer, which I realize a lot of you are not, I'm a huge fan of design packs, right? 400 bucks, they'll build you landing pages, and they take art direction like the best creative directors that, I, that I've worked with, right? I mean, it shocks me how good the landing pages you can get from design packs are. My favorite example of this is actually for a business um, that we did some early experiments with within side of Birchmere and ultimately didn't... Um, we put a little bit of money in, like $10,000, and then stopped. But um, it was a business targeting um, young mother, mothers of young children. Um, not young mothers, but mothers of young children. Uh, and so I asked the design packs person to get me a photo of, um, of a soccer mom sort of looking frustrated, right, and that holding a, a gas pump because uh, it, it was a general budget kind of saving thing. <laughs> Within two hours, they got me back like that exact image, right? It is amazing what they'll do for you, right? And you ought to just invest the money, unless you're a designer yourself, to get these, these well done against less than 400 bucks. So a couple of thoughts on, on landing pages. Um, the next one is, is demo videos. Um, and this one I used to spend a lot of time describing. And I've come to realize that actually just showing you the Dropbox video, uh, which takes a couple of minutes, is actually a much, much better way to do this than talking about it for a while. So I'm not going to show you the whole video. The link's at the bottom if you want to watch it, but I'm going to show you just a couple minutes of the video. For context here, this is a video the CEO of Dropbox created before he had Dropbox completely working. And you have to remember contextually that at this point in time, there were lots of ways to share files on the Internet. So using techniques like landing pages, Right? wouldn't have worked well because if I had said, hey, I've got a way to help you share files, people would be like, yeah, kind of like uh, Yahoo. Right? Um, so he had to kind of make it come to life. Uh, and you'll see a couple of things I just want to call your attention to before I play the video. Uh, one thing that's interesting, I think, is that they end up, uh, he ends up kind of using funny references through the video. That's not just because he's a funny guy, although Drew is, but that's because he was hoping that it would get picked up by a lot of the social aggregators, which it did. And the other thing is, 
you'll see a number of times where he makes it look like things are working that were not yet working. But you can slice these, these videos just using a simple tool. I think he used Camtasia, but a simple kind of video editing tool to actually fake things working before they're working that works out quite well. Um, so I'm going to play this video for you, um, and then we'll come back and talk about the fourth of the uh, minimally awesome product ideas. Let's see. I'm sorry? Uh, so it's called Dropbox Demo, and it was um, the link is on the slides that you guys will get as well. Um, so I'm hoping that this is going to, oh, you know what? There we go. Nope. Hmm. Okay, give me one minute. In a second, my account will be linked, and you can see that the file... Sorry, uh, mirroring was not my friend on that. Here we go. We need a quick tour of Dropbox, which is a new way to store and share files online. What makes Dropbox different is that it just works, and there isn't any complicated setup or interface to learn. So let's get started. I've already installed Dropbox on a Windows PC and put a bunch of files in, and now I want to sync these files to my Mac. So to do that, I just installed Dropbox, and now I'm linking my Mac to my account. So in a second, my account will be linked, and you can see that the files that were on my Windows PC will start coming down. And what we're looking at is my Dropbox folder, which looks and acts like any other folder except for two things. One, these little green icons that indicate files are up to date. And two, anything in my Dropbox is synced across all of my computers into the web. And you'll notice that when I make changes, uh, everything syncs up pretty quickly. And as another example, I'm going to log in my Windows PC, where you'll see that not only are the changes from my Mac already here, but if I make another change to a file, so for example, this picture of a platypus, and then I hit Save, uh, the change begins uploading immediately. And when I go back to my Mac, uh, the change is reflected in a matter of seconds. So the point is, if you've ever worked with multiple computers or carried around a USB drive or emailed yourself files from work, you can see this is a much easier way of managing your stuff. And we also protect you from the bad things that can happen to your files. So if I delete a bunch of stuff, we have this web interface where you can not only get to your files in case you're not at one of your computers, so here are the contents of my Dropbox here, uh, but we have the Show Deleted Files link where you can select a file that you've deleted, and then you have an option to bring it back uh, in a couple of clicks. So I'll do that, and instantly the file's back. And not only do you have the option of restoring the most recent version, but actually any, ver any prior version of a file. Uh, and Dropbox is also very efficient about the way it handles changes to files and sends only the pieces that change. So in the case of the platypus picture, just sending the delta saved over 80% of the bandwidth. So that covers a lot of how we make it easy to access and So he goes on. It's, it's a five-minute video. Um, but I think the point that is important here, can you guys Okay. I think the point that's important here is, right, if he had done this as a landing page video, right, it would have said things like, hey, don't like bringing USB sticks around, ever forget your files at home, right? And I think the problem is people would have looked at that and said, yeah, but I, you know, I know I've used software interfaces to solve that problem before. But it's actually watching him use it and then doing things like the platypus. He talks about going to concerts, right? It ended up getting a lot of play on um, dig.com when that was like a relevant thing. Um, and so he ended up getting 25,000 people to email him to beta at getdropbox.com at the end of the video, which became a great set of early customers, but more importantly, right, a set of customers he could talk to about, so what sounded interesting to you about that idea, right? So in terms of uh, effort to maximum amount of validated learning about your customers, right, I'd argue that's a very kind of high effort to signal ratio for him. Um, so it doesn't work for every solution for sure, um, but it's one that I think 
uh, it shouldn't be overlooked, and it's actually probably one that I don't see used as much. So if I see landing pages used all the time, which I do, I would say this one I feel like is an underutilized tool in a lot of entrepreneurs' toolboxes. And then the last of these is the Wizard of Oz. Um, and I just did this Monday in uh, one of the graduate courses that I teach here on entrepreneurship, and I realized that like the cultural reference just was missed on a lot of people, right? So, um, Wizard of Oz is a, is a movie, um, right? And if you remember, there's this uh, person behind the curtain who's sort of acting like something else, right? And so the idea here is that you, the entrepreneur, are behind a fictitious curtain doing the work that later you expect your product to do. So the way this works is you have a website that says, hey, company XYZ does magic or does whatever and upload this file and we'll do it for you. We'll do this magical thing for you. And then when they upload the file or take the action or request more information or whatever, instead of software doing anything, the next step is an email gets fired off to your team who turns around and does some work and then creates the automated response for you, for the customers, right? Um, so we've used this um, in a lot of our companies early in. And then the other thing actually that we've seen start to work well is for a number of our companies where they're thinking about adjacent product offerings as they start to scale out, this becomes really interesting to test adjacent product offerings. So I'll give you an example of both. So we had um, a couple of students actually of mine um, who were in the uh, machine learning program here that were working on technology that could take legal text and turn it into structured data. Um, uh, CMU OFEF is actually an investor along with Birchmere in this company called Legal Sifter. And early on, we became pretty confident that we could run statistical models over these legal contracts to extract the relevant data, right? So we could say who the counterparty is, does the contract auto renew or auto terminate, how much money is the contract for? So we had a bunch of, we became pretty confident we could do this, but the question was, well, what was the best use of that technology? So how should we turn that into a product? Well, it turns out that there's this group of people called paralegals that you can pay to turn contracts into structured data. And in fact, there's hundreds of thousands of them across the U.S. who do that. And um, so we just, for a little while, paid some paralegals to do the work that we were later going to have software do. And it was very helpful for us to understand what are the use cases people would want to solve for with technology like ours. Um, and particularly relevant because one of the things we came to realize is that selling that solution to lawyers is not well received because um, Dave talked about keeping me out of the terrible throes of becoming a consultant. The only worse career than becoming a consultant is becoming a lawyer, right? Um, and selling Legal Sifter was actually like a really helpful way for me to illustrate this point. I would go talk to law firms and I'd say, hey, I can help you bill your clients less hours. And they would hear, hey, I can help you make less money, which is not actually something that they're very in favor of, right? It turned out that the conversation with um, groups in procurement departments across the country became very different though because one of the things we learned about procurement professionals is that they practice law without a law degree and so this technology became very helpful to help procurement off offices automate a lot of their workflow. Again, it was very helpful to have kind of a working product before we had a product to demonstrate a lot of that. Maybe an even more interesting example, um, and I don't think this is completely public so I'd ask you guys uh, to keep it here, but you know, Rob Myers now an EIR here, so I figure all no wait stories are now uh, open book for for CMU. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to get to know Rob yet, you you really should. He's uh, entrepreneur in residence is the title, right, Dave? Yeah, he's an entrepreneur in residence here at um, CMU CIE, and, and um, you guys are incredibly lucky to have him. He's the founder of No Wait. Um, so one of the um, one of the things that we're starting to do at No Wait, so f for those of you who aren't familiar with No Wait, it's this iPad application that replaces the pagers that you get at casual dining restaurants. So the restaurant replaces their pager system. So you go to a Chili's and they give you a buzzer. Instead, now they just take your cell phone number and they text you and you can see where you are in line and when you need to come back. You can also pull the consumer app up and see the weight of all the restaurants around here. So 
if it's Saturday night and you're trying to figure out where in Shadyside to go, you can see the weight of all the restaurants in Shadyside, put yourself in line at the restaurant you want to go to, and then 10 minutes before your table is ready, walk out your house or apartment and walk into that restaurant. It's a, truly a magical experience. So the interesting thing about No Wait is that, that business is going great. We're starting very, very early to test a new product called um, Concierge, which does the same thing for restaurants that take reservations, right? So all of our restaurants today are non-reservation restaurants. We're starting to now do this with reservation-taking restaurants. So if you want to go eat dinner at Kaya or Soba or one of the sort of nicer restaurants in Shadyside slash the East End that doesn't use pagers and doesn't manage their wait list off of a queue, you can now request through no wait a reservation for that night at that restaurant. And how we're doing that today is that there's actually engineering and product people on Friday and Saturday night who are texting back and forth with the customers to actually see like, so the customer says, I'd like a table uh, for four at Soba Friday night at seven o'clock. Product person or engineering person says, great, I'll, let me check with them, I'll get back to you. Person calls Kaya, says, hey, I have a party for four at seven o'clock, can you do it? If they say yes, text back, confirm the application and, and seat them. If no, how about 7.30, right? So all this stuff today is happening with people. Um, soon that will all be happening with software. But I guarantee you the first version of what No Wait builds will be for this concierge app will be a lot better because of the time they've spent doing this, right? So Wizard of Oz, really great early on, like the Legal Sifter example. Also, as you think about adjacent markets, I think it becomes a really, really... Um, powerful technique. Um, right, and so uh, we, we're going to skip the group application. I was going to have you think about these and take a couple of your ideas, but we're just going to keep moving along because I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end. Um, and I want to just move right now to five misunderstandings about these MVPs. And I'm going to start with a story to illustrate the point. Um, so I went to, uh, this is not an American startup. Uh, this actually happened to me when I was in Lisbon, Portugal. So every year with the Kauffman Foundation, I go to Lisbon and somewhere else in Europe as part of this trip called Silicon Valley Comes to Europe. And the deal with Kauffman is I'll go to whatever second country they want as long as one of the countries is Portugal because I actually really have some friends over there. I'm actually from CMU and it's kind of a fun excuse to see them once a year on the Kauffman Foundation's time, which is very generous of them. Um, and so I've done like Lisbon, London, Lisbon, Madrid. Uh, so I was in Lisbon, this was a couple of years ago, and I met these entrepreneurs who had, um, like all entrepreneurs, right, they looked at the world and they saw the world as broken. And like all software entrepreneurs, they thought the solution to that brokenness in the world was software, right? And I say this because that's almost every software entrepreneur I talk to, myself included, right? This is what they, we think. We think like, oh, that doesn't work. Let me use software to make the world the way it ought to be. Uh, interestingly, they had decided, they had both just gotten married, and they had decided that they were going to fix the process of planning a wedding, um, uh, which may or may not be a good idea. Um, maybe that's broken, maybe that's not. I think there's an interesting gender split on how you would answer that question. Um, but uh, that was their perception. Um, and specifically, the reason that they were, that they started, started talking about this is they talked about all the hours that they spent talking about like the right color tissue paper and the invitations, all that kind of stuff. If you're looking for current references on this, um, Rob Meyer's getting married, so he could be a good guy to kind of walk you through this, this pain point. You can ask Uncle Rob uh, what to do. My advice to him was uh, always care a lot and try to answer the way your prospective spouse wants. Because you don't want to say, like, I don't care, beige versus off-white, because they're the same color, um, which is the, ch that's the challenge with that question. Um, but uh, I don't care implies you don't care about a lot of other things. Um, and I should say, like, uh, it still amazes me every day when I wake up that my wife is still married to me. Like, I've, like getting married was the best thing I did. But it is kind of a frustrating experience for guys to kind of plan uh, plan weddings. So these guys were like lean entrepreneurship fanboys, right? Saw the world is broken, they're going to fix it. And they had like read the book, they had like 
dog-eared pages. They had post-it notes sticking out of it. I'm fairly confident they slept with the book underneath their pillow to like buy osmosis, learn more about uh, lean entrepreneurship. I mean, so these guys were like, they were really in to the lean entrepreneurship uh, methodology. And they, like a lot of entrepreneurs, decided they were going to start with the landing page to validate or invalidate their idea. Right? And so they had created a landing page that talked all about the benefits of using their system to plan weddings more efficiently. It talked about how it could help you pick your invitations better, how you find a reception hall better. And then they went and they did exactly what you're supposed to do. They went to Facebook and they found a bunch of people who demographically were females likely in an age range where they would be getting married or have friends that were getting married. And they spent $10,000 driving traffic from that landing page or from Facebook to that landing page. And they had different landing pages that showed different benefit statements. And I said, oh, that's, this all felt right to me. I was actually quite excited. I was like, wow, they really get it. I said, well, what was the conversion rate? And they said, 0%. And I was like, that is impossible. Because I've, I've been doing these tests long before Eric wrote a book. I mean, Dave and I did these tests when we were at Emsfog. These tests, have, we've been doing them for a long time. I've never, ever gotten a 0% conversion rate. Like, I could build a landing page that says, I'm a Somalian prince. Please enter your social security number and your email address here, and I would get better than a 0% conversion rate before Facebook shut that ad down, right? 0% does not happen. So it's like they must have forgotten to test the submit button. Like it's the only thing in my head that could, I was like, I was grasping, I was like, everything seemed right. The only solution I could with is they, they forgot to QA. I thought this is gonna be embarrassing for them, but like be a good object lesson. So we pull up the page and I'm thinking like, I'm gonna fill it out, hit submit, nothing's gonna happen on their end. And I'm gonna like, see, you need to test your software before you release it. Or maybe use a tool like Optimizely so that you say you have somebody who this is what they do do it. Um, but I didn't actually need to actually hit the submit button because when the page loaded, I immediately knew what the problem was. This was a four page long, scrolling long landing page, black text on a white background. And you remember like vintage 99 or 2000, um, the HTML submit forms, like the gray submit button with the unsigned, yeah, that was, that was the request more information form at the bottom. So I said to them, like, remember your opening problem statement was beige versus off-white. Yeah. Do you think somebody who's just spent the last three months obsessing about the difference in color between beige and off-white is going to want to use a tool that looks like this, right? And the color drained from their face. And immediately I had this realization, which I've been basically beating the drum ever since, which is the term viable has caused a really big problem in the lean entrepreneurship market, right? One, it lets guys tell MVP jokes, and I just, I don't understand the sports reference. But two, yeah, I, I, that one I could get over, but two, Viable means crappy to way too many entrepreneurs, right? People say I'm going to build a minimally viable product. And what they actually think is I'm going to build a minimally crappy product, right? And the reality is to get the maximum amount of validated learning with the minimum amount of effort, what you want to do is build something that's awesome, but just not a lot of it, right? So if you're going to do a landing page, make it an awesome landing page right? But just, just do that. Don't build a lot of other stuff too, right? If you're going to do a Wizard of Oz, make sure that experience is good. Maybe you only open it up to 10 people, but make sure those 10 people have a great experience with it, or at least the experience that you envision. Because if they have a great experience with it and it works, you learn something from that. If they have the experience you imagine and it doesn't work, you learn something about it. These guys they don't know if their wedding planning idea was a good one or a bad one because there's no signal in a four page long black on a white background uh, paragraphs of text landing page, right? That's just a crappy thing and that's just a waste of $10,000 and a waste of whatever time they put against it. So I start, I've started calling them minimally awesome products and services. It has the second advantage that the acronym now is MAP 
which is exactly what this is, right? These are supposed to be a map to help you understand the thing you're building against the vision that you're ultimately um, trying to build. But instead of it being a product vision, it's a customer vision, right? And that leads to the second point. A minimally awesome product is not a destination, right? A minimally awesome product is not a destination. The number of people who come into my office and say, Sean, give me a quarter million dollars so I can build my MVP, or maybe they've heard about my obsession with this term, minimally awesome, and they say, give me a quarter million dollars so I can build my MAP, right, it are a crazy high percentage, right? And the point is not that you raise $250,000 and you build a MVP or an MAP, right? The point is that you build a lot of minimally awesome products and services through the spending of, of a quarter million dollars to help you figure out where you want to go, right? And so here is a, and again, you'll get these slides, but here's an example of how I would like to see the map drawn, right? So instead of the map being about geographies, right, this is a map about learnings about your customer. So, um, does this work? Yeah. So you start with the first one, kind of your first landing page. Maybe it is a landing page or, your, or maybe it's a video or whatever. Your customer interacts with it a certain way. You learn a certain amount, you spend a little bit of money. Like if this, if this first version is like more than $20,000, you're doing something wrong, um, right? And then you learn some things from that. That doesn't necessarily mean, by the way, that you only need to raise $20,000. It just means you should start to get customer feedback a lot faster than a quarter million dollars. The next one is maybe you do some detailed specs. You go sit down with people and maybe you're trying to help them, get them to actually pay you money, right? There's there are very few uh, better validated learnings than a contract. Contracts are great validated learnings, right? And then maybe you build a functional prototype, right? And you might have many more steps than these three. This, the idea, similar to those four not being prescriptive, the idea is not that this is always the right set of three things to build, but that you want to build something, learn from it, build something else, learn from it, build something else, learn from it, right? So that's the... Second misconception. The third one is it should validate or invalidate key hypotheses about your customers. I ran out of text for the about your customers, but key hypotheses about your customers rarely is the key hypothesis, can I do this? Right? It's usually, does anybody care if I do that? That's a much better hypothesis than can I do it? Right? And that's actually really disappointing, right? especially at a place like Carnegie Mellon. It would be great if the key hypothesis was, can I build what I set out to build, right? Because if that was the thing you were trying to validate, that would make entrepreneurship really, really fair, right? It would mean that success in entrepreneurship was a function of working really hard and being really smart. And if you're going to school here, you're really smart. So if you work really hard, you'll win, right? But that's not actually the game of entrepreneurship at all, right? The game is, can you actually build something that people care about? And so spending a bunch of time proving that you can do something really complicated is very rarely the right first thing to validate about your business. The next one, it doesn't have to be a product at all. Like hopefully the earlier part of this um, illustrated this. And similar, the other kind of misconception along this line is it doesn't always have to start as a landing page, right? So those would be the kind of two kind of picking back up. So, so we've now, we're now um, kind of halfway through this talk, maybe a little more from a calendar time perspective, but halfway through the meat of this. So we've talked about what to build, right? And I gave you four specific examples plus some general comments on that. The other part of this is how do you build it, right? And the answer from this perspective, as probably shouldn't be surprising to you given the title of this talk, we're going to argue is that you need to build this in an agile way. And the thing about the term agile, right, is that it's become this buzzword in business, right? People use agile all the time, right? There's like agile sales, agile marketing. Someone sent me an email last week about agile HR. I don't, I'm still not really sure what that is, but, but, um, but like we just sort of attach agile to things because we, make, we think it makes it sound better. Like it's become kind of a business term for better sales. Well, agile sales must be better than, than unagile sales, right? That's not what, for the next 40 minutes, that's not what we mean by the term agile. We don't mean better. 
What we mean is literally Agile as defined by the Agile Manifesto, right? So just as a reminder, 2001, 15 guys, really good at software development, go to a ski lodge in the middle of nowhere and spend a weekend talking about what good software projects look like versus what bad software projects look like. And they come up with these four simple statements at the end of the weekend about the things that are more true about good projects than bad projects, right? And they say, we value these over these. And they're very deliberate about this. It's not that we don't value the things in white text over here. It's that we value this more. And I can tell you in 2001, because I was a research fellow at the Software Industry Center at the time, this felt awesome at the time when this was written, right? Because for years, we've been coming up with terrible analogies for how to build software. And this became kind of a great litmus test to think about the process of building software. And so this is what we mean by Agile, at least for the next 37 minutes. And then you can go back to using it as good or awesome or however you want. Right? But it's valuing individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working products over documentation, collaborating with your customers over negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. Right? So that's what we mean by Agile. And there's become lots of different things that uh, lots of different methodologies that have, have come up to kind of encapsulate those four value statements, right? But the reason we think that's really good for software development is because of three simple things. In a startup, you're going to be wrong way more often than you're right, right? So projects that look more like the blue text on the slide before than the white will do well with this fast, this fast incorrect and invalidation of hypotheses. The key metric that you need to think about is how quickly can you get through one of those build, measure, learn cycles, right? Because maybe three build, measure, learn cycles from now, your co-founder is going to need to go work at Google if you don't have this working because he's got to get it or she's got to get a visa. Or maybe you're going to run out of money in five cycles from right now. And so you need, to, you need to know how fast can you get through those build, measure, learn cycles. And you need to be able to predict the amount of time it's going to take you to get through one of those, right? So that's why we think this is the right way to build it. And we're going to specifically talk for the next few minutes about Scrum, right? And Scrum is this very interesting sort of management wrapper that can layer around any of the different agile engineering practices that you like, right? So whether it's XP or feature-driven development or Kanban or whatever, Scrum becomes this nice management layer that you can wrap around it, which becomes really helpful. We, you know, why do we focus on Scrum? Well, the short, this is probably a little bit too text heavy of a slide, but the reason is uh, we've used it in our organization. So the, the organization that Dave and I ran together, Mspoke, we actually went from not using Scrum to using Scrum together. We took it so seriously that we actually made the board read the Scrum book and come to a sprint planning process. And I actually ran the sprints for the first uh, four or five sprints. Um, Right? So we, well, so I, to me, the, the bigger point was we knew there were people who were better. Right? Our QA guy was a hundred times more qualified to do it than I was, but there was no missing how important a value it was in our organization that one of the founders was actually going to waste or spend, depending on how you look at it, his time doing this for four. Right? So we saw, and it was transformational for our organization. I'm going to show you a less than 10 minute video on Scrum give you a few slides. We're going to rip through the slides quickly on um, some observations about Scrum within startups, and then we'll do Q&A on any topic you want. Maybe we're going to do that. Team roles, sprints, burnout charts, and more. So get ready to be bombarded with information. Let's say this is the product we want to build. For this product, we get all kinds of feature requests from customers, executives, or even other team members. In Scrum, features are written from the perspective of the end user. Therefore, features are known as user stories. The collection of all these user stories is called the product backlog. Another way to think of the product backlog is to think of it as a wish list of all the things that would make this product great. Once we have our wish list or the product backlog, we need to start planning which specific user stories we're going to be putting into a particular release of our product. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. 
Let's back up a bit. To build this product, we need to have one or more people on our team who are going to play a variety of roles. First, we need her. She plays the role of product owner and helps make sure the right features make it into the product backlog, representing the users and customers of the product. She helps set the direction of the product. Then we need this guy. He's the Scrum Master, and his job is to make sure the project is progressing smoothly and that every member of the team has the tools they need to get their job done. He sets up meetings, monitors the work being done, and facilitates release planning. He's a lot like a project manager, but that's such a boring title, so we'll call him a Scrum Master to imply he knows some jujitsu. And the rest of the team has similar roles to other development processes. These guys build the product, while these guys test it to make sure it works right. These guys use it and hopefully pay for it. And these guys, they generally get in the way. But it turns out you can't build many products without them. But let's get back to this, release planning. To plan a release, the team starts with this, the product backlog. And they identify the user stories they want to put into this release. These user stories then become part of the release backlog. The team then prioritizes the user stories and estimates the amount of work involved for each item. Sometimes larger user stories are broken down into smaller, more manageable chunks. The collection of all the estimates provides a rough idea of the total amount of work involved to complete the entire release. A quick side note about estimates. There are a lot of techniques for creating good estimates. Some prefer estimating in story points, where estimates are made relative to building a small component with a known level of difficulty. Unfortunately, story points don't answer the question of, when will my project ship? I found that the best technique is to estimate work in hours, but to use some standards in how estimates are done. For example, things that take less than a day to complete will be estimated as one hour, two hours, four hours, or eight hours. Every item will fall into one of those buckets. There will be no three-hour estimates, for example. A three-hour item would fall into the four-hour bucket. Larger items will be estimated as two days, three days, five days, or ten days. Again, all estimates in between will fall into the next larger bucket. Extremely large items are similarly estimated in months. One, two, three, or six months. But the reality is that such items will need to be broken down substantially before work actually begins. We'll come back to these estimates in just a minute. But for now, let's get back to this, the release backlog. With a prioritized set of user stories and the estimated amount of work at hand, we're now ready to plan out several sprints to get the work done. Sprints are short duration milestones that allow teams to tackle a manageable chunk of the project and get it to a ship ready state. Sprints generally range from a couple of days to as much as 30 days in length, depending on their product's release cycles. The shorter the release cycles, the shorter each sprint should be. And you want to have at least two to as many as a dozen sprints in a given release. So at this point, we can take our release backlog and split it up into several of these sprint backlogs. One of the most important things to remember about sprints is that the goal of each sprint is to get a subset of the release backlog to a ship-ready state. So at the end of each sprint, you should have a fully tested product with all the features of the sprint 100% complete. Since sprints are a very short but a realistic representation of part of the product, a late finish of the sprint is a great indicator that the project is not on schedule and something needs to be done. Therefore, it's extremely important to monitor the progress of each sprint with this, a burndown chart. The burndown chart is the number one reason for Scrum's popularity and one of the best project visibility tools to ensure a project is progressing smoothly. The burndown chart provides a day-by-day -day measure of the amount of work that remains in a given sprint or release. In this graph, you can see that the amount of work remaining bounces up and down from day to day, but is generally trending towards zero. Because historical information is provided in the burndown chart, it's easy to see if the team is on the right track. Using the burndown chart, the team can quickly calculate this, the slope of the graph, which is also called the burndown velocity. This is the average rate of productivity for each day. For example, a team's rate of productivity might be that on a typical day they finish approximately 50 hours of work. Knowing that, it's possible to calculate an estimated completion date for the sprint, or even for the entire release based on the amount of work remaining. What's great about the burndown chart is that we can compare our actual velocity and projected completion date to what the team needs to do in order to finish on time. This is perhaps the most useful piece of knowledge that any team member, product owner, or product executive can have about the project. Because knowing whether or not the project is on track early in the schedule can help teams make the proper adjustments necessary to get the project on track. The burndown chart provides empirical proof that the project is on track or if it's going to be late. So let's talk a little about where the data for this incredibly useful burndown chart comes from. As you recall, part of the release planning process was to create an estimate for each user story in the release backlog. The collection of these estimates for a given sprint represents the total amount of work that must be done to complete that sprint. 
As each team member goes through and makes progress on one or more of the user stories, they simply update the amount of time remaining for each of their own items. So the total amount of time remaining on the group of user stories that make up a sprint changes on a day-by-day -day basis, hopefully going downward until it hits zero when the sprint is complete. The burndown chart aggregates the remaining work data and shows it visually. It's brilliant because it communicates a massive amount of information in just a few seconds. And that brings us to this, the Daily Scrum. The Daily Scrum is an essential tool to having communication flow freely between team members. The idea is to have fast-paced, stand-up meetings where team members quickly list the work they have completed since the last meeting and any obstacles in their way. By meeting daily, it ensures the team is always in sync and any major issues are dealt with as soon as they are known. Finally, as each sprint comes to a finish, it's important to have a sprint retrospective meeting where the team can reflect on what went right and areas of improvement. After all, Scrum is a flexible, agile development method that needs constant improving and tweaking for every team. So there you have it, Scrum in under 10 minutes. You now know all the essential... All right, and then he promotes his, his uh, software product, which you don't actually need. So, uh, but that was a helpful video otherwise. Um, okay, so why do we focus on Scrum? Right, uh, that gives you kind of a quick summary of how it works. A couple of things I just want to talk about from seeing people apply this into startups, and then we'll have at least 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, one thing, right, uh, we found that this daily meeting, um, sometimes daily, is a little too much in a startup, right? So you can do the same thing, but you don't have to do it every day, um, especially if there's like three of you and you're, uh, in one office, like you probably don't need every day to review that. It is still helpful though to a couple times a week at least get together and say, well like, what's getting in the way of our progress? What are you working on? What are you planning to work on until we meet again? Um, another thing, we found that 30 days isn't always the right amount of time for a sprint. Um, it's helpful to have this always be the same amount or to try to pick a time and be consistent with it. So if you want to go with 20 days or 15 days, that's fine, but like, Try to do it consistently. The other thing is if this is a project you're working on primarily on nights and weekends, then maybe what you want to do is, you know, so many weekends uh, as your unit of measure, right? So we've seen people do like eight weekend days between sprints because that ends up kind of being where most of the progress is, is being made early on. Um, so some tips and tricks for implementing it. Um, there's lots of software. That guy whose video I just played is one of many pieces of people who've created software to do Scrum. But we've actually found that a Google spreadsheet works really, really well. And it also has the benefit of being free. Because um, really everything you're doing with those burn down charts, both at the product level and the sprint level, ultimately are just doing Excel calculations and doing graphs. And it turns out a spreadsheet, Google spreadsheet, everybody can see Everybody can have visibility to, and it's free, which is a great price for a startup. Um, product backlog. The one thing I want to emphasize here is that this list is prioritized, right? So the product backlog or the product wish list, it's a prioritized list of things. And your estimates on things at the top of that priority list versus things at the bottom, uh, you know, they need different levels of estimation. Um, Anybody can add things to the backlog, but only one person sets the priority. Typically in a startup, we found that to be the CEO. But Whomever I'm sorry. Ex excuse me. Um, yeah. In Silicon Valley, we, we seem to have a, a bad connection. Um, if you don't mind, we're going to uh, disconnect, and then if you could call us right back, maybe we can get a more connection, better connection because your your audio and video is, is cutting in and out. Oh, sorry. sure. I hope you haven't had that for an hour and a half, um, or for an hour. No. Okay, he's, he's going to work happened. on it in the back. So I'm getting a thumbs up from the tech in the back, so he'll work on that. Um, okay, uh, we'll keep moving here in Pittsburgh. Um, right, so anybody can add things to the backlog, but the product owner sets the priority of, uh, of that. Um, and everybody can see it, right? So if Dave's the product owner and I'm trying to convince Dave to add something to the product backlog, like he would have to add it to the backlog but it would be up to Dave to set where the priority is in it. So if I go to Dave, Dave, I've got this awesome idea. This button on our, on our website is blue right now. Let's make it red. He'd be like, Sean, that's a great idea. I will put that on the backlog at the bottom of the list, right below all the other things we're never going to do. Um, right? But he added the backlog. Now, anybody can see the backlog. right? So I could go to Dave and say, hey, Dave, I saw you put that at the bottom of the list. And he's like, well, yes, yeah, it's a terrible idea, Sean. And, 
And I said, well, if you do it, I can probably get uh, our venture fund to invest more money into your startup. Goes way up the product back. All of a sudden, it's reprioritized differently, right? So, so the 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 backlog actually works as a very effective way. Similarly, whether you share the backlog or not with customers, the you want to make sure you're kind of communicating this to them, right? So, if your customer says, "Hey, can you make that button red?" Yeah, we'll put it on the backlog. It's going to be quite a while until we get to it. Well, I'll go ahead and sign the renewal for next year if that button's red. Okay, we'll get it done in the next sprint, right? So you kind of have this flexible uh, prioritization using the backlog. Um, you know, these are just some screenshots from it. It's it's uh, easy for you to look at those um, afterwards, but you can see like the idea is each each um, row in the spreadsheet here becomes an estimate at the beginning and the end of the sprint. So beginning end of sprint one, beginning end of sprint two, et cetera. Um, uh, then each sprint, right, you set up a separate spreadsheet and it lasts for a defined number of days. Again, it's helpful for it to, to be kind of consistently the same number of days. And up front you say, this is the macro goal that we're trying to achieve in this sprint and you know, accomplish the following things. Um, so I know that in the video they talked about the most popular reason or most popular thing for Scrum being the burn down chart. That's probably true. I actually think one of the most helpful things about Scrum, though, is this discipline of all estimates being forward-looking. And he doesn't talk about this a lot in the video, so I just want to emphasize this, right? So the reason sometimes your burn-down chart actually goes up before it goes down is because sometimes when you're building products, you think, oh, this will take me about 12 hours. And then you work on it for four hours, and you go, uh-oh, this is going to take me 30 hours. Right? The problem with the way a lot of people do estimates is they would take 12, subtract 4, and make their estimate 8. That's not how it works in Scrum. The idea is that the next day when you do your estimate, you ignore the sunk cost of all the time you've spent on the project up till then, and you say, okay, between where I am right now and when this project is done, how long do I think it's going to take me now to get this done? And so if it was 12 the first day, and then you work on it for four hours, and now you think it's 20, the estimate is 20, that would be a burn up of eight hours. Now maybe some of your teammates have made some progress so the, the chart may or may not burn up eight hours. The interesting thing about this is you find when you do this for a couple of sprints that it actually becomes surprisingly predictable how often those things happen, right? And so you get pretty good at understanding, okay, across 20 or 30 days, on average, I'm gonna burn down X hours per engineer or X hours per team a day, right? Even though on a micro level, day by day, sometimes those estimates are going up and down. They tend to do it kind of consistently. And this becomes really helpful because then you can look at the amount of work you have remaining before your next major release, look at the number of hours, divide it by your productivity velocity, and now all of a sudden you can call that customer a month out from when you promise them a feature and say, hey, I know I told you this was going to be done in 30 days. I either need an extra week or I'm going to need to cut some stuff out of that release and we'll catch the rest of it on the next one. And here's the cool thing about that conversation. When you call a customer a month out and have that conversation, you can have an entirely rational conversation about it. When you call them two days before that release, and say the exact same thing. I either need to cut a couple of things or I need an extra week, right? At that point, he's told his boss, right, or her boss, um, and there is no rational part of that conversation, right? It becomes 100% emotion, right? And so the, this sort of process of estimating becomes really helpful for you to be able to kind of throw the flag early. Similarly, if you have two more months before your co-founder needs to go get that job at Google, right? You can two months out decide what you're going to do and not do based on your velocity, not try to make that decision two days before he or she has to go get another job or you have to raise more money, right? I don't like getting the call from an entrepreneur a week before they're out of money. Hey, I need a little bit more money before I release this, um, right? So it's really, really helpful to do estimates this way. 
um, and that leads to the velocity, right? So this is the same kind of chart as the burn down chart, but instead of this being sprint one, sprint end of, beginning end of sprint one, beginning end of sprint two, this is your original estimates and then day by day. And that creates these really nice burn down charts like you saw. Uh, the last point on this is it's really helpful at the end, as he talked about, to actually do these retrospectives. It's shocking to me how much information you can get from your engineers when you stop and spend four hours as a team talking about like, well, how could this project have gone better? So that is um, Agile Product Development. We have 15, we have 17 minutes um, before I think they're going to kick us out of this room. So uh, any questions on anything you want? Yeah. Continue, do I just put the rest of them in the next frame? Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. And over time, you're probably going to want to start to pick fewer number of hours for every sprint, estimated hours of work, right? Because what you want to get good at is saying, okay, my team can do approximately X hours a, a sprint. Uh, it seems like internally, the build measure learn cycle is a lot like build and then build and then build. Like on one extreme you have that really crappy website for the, for the wedding planning. On the other extreme you get like a product that's so far down the road you won't change because you, you won't get customer feedback. Like, do you have any tips for mitigating when you initiate that customer feedback cycle? Like obviously you don't want to go too early and too late. You're too set in your ways. Like, do you have any yeah, I mean, so, so I would say I agree with everything you said except for obviously you don't want to go too early. Like I'm not actually sure how you go too early. Right. So if what you mean is you don't want to get product feedback too early, but like fully functioning product feedback, I agree. But like I actually would probably, if anything, argue the opposite, which is it's good to get a bunch of product feedback on the idea, whether it's through storyboards, interviews, which we, which I think about more as measure learn techniques. I didn't talk about it here, but you know, just going out and doing structured interviews is really helpful. Um, landing pages you know, 500 bucks on design packs and 72 hours later you can start getting feedback on benefits, right? So I think, um, you know, what you really want to do is you want to, um, you want to start getting feedback basically immediately up front. And then what that helps you do is start to prioritize that product wish list or product backlog in such a way that it's kind of a continuous iterative approach. It's a good question though. Yeah. CEO no longer have a personal daily part of this process? So uh, the, the question, if I'm understanding it, is like, when is this, the product CEO no longer the product owner? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure there's like a one-size-fits-all answer to that question, um, but in general, um, and the reason I think there's not a one-size-fits-all is like different teams are structured differently, right? So if, even if I just think about some of the investments that we've made, right? We have CEOs who are probably more sales and marketing type CEOs and they may have a different co-founder who's more the product um, visionary. Um, and certainly that person is often able to stay in the product owner's seat much longer. Um, and then in a couple cases we have I mean, like we have a company that's raised almost $20 million um, where the CEO is a product visionary and to this day, he still um, will have quite a bit of influence over the prioritization. Now he has product managers who are probably more like product, he has product owners who are probably more like product managers, like they sort of manage the actual logistics of releases and things like that. But in terms of uh, prioritization, he still has quite a bit of influence on it. And I mean, th these guys have, you know, eight figures of revenue and um, 100 employees at this point, right? So, so I'm not sure there's like a one-size-fits-all answer to it. I do think um, by the time you start to have teams working on different products, it's helpful to have a GM of the product. Um, and how much of that is management versus vision and leadership, I think, is more of a situational uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, Sh Sean? What are you saying? This, oh. Sean, this is Silicon Valley. Oh, yes. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, this is Ravi Thomas from Silicon Valley. Hey. A couple of our students have questions. Okay. Could we uh, sure. break in here? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Hi, sir. My name is Neha. Thank you for the wonderful session. So I, I would like to ask you, can you just explain a bit more on the multiple roles that the, the team, the Scrum team plays in the developer cycle? The different roles that people on the Scrum team play? Yes. Okay. I mean, at the, uh, for example, there is a delay or in the estimates or there is a delay in deployment. Then various people play multiple roles. So how come is it challenging in the real world scenario? Um, so I guess I'll do my best to answer it, but if this doesn't feel like it answers the question, uh, to come back and ask a follow-up maybe. Um, so if your point is like you've got a scrum team of engineers and, you know, one part of the product backlog or sprint backlog, I'm sorry, takes a lot longer than you originally estimated, maybe other engineers on the team will chip in to help solve for that. I think that's true. Uh, if that's unsolvable, then I think it's kind of the scrum master's job to throw the, the warning flag that, hey, this sprint's not going to end on time. Um, and then I think it's a situation by situation in terms of how the org would communicate that to the customers. Is that kind of what you were looking for, or did I misunderstand the question? Yeah, uh, it was so briefly you touched upon that. I, would, I was just asking from the engineering perspective, that uh, how challenging is for the employee to take the multiple hats and uh, do the multiple roles in the same thing. You mean like multiple roles like front end engineer, back end engineer, that kind of thing? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I do. So this is this is a uh, Dave and I, I think have done this as a workshop together a couple times, and we do this with with um, the Tupper class that we've taught together. I do think there's a related question to what you're getting to, which is early in these companies' development, you really want what he and I describe as kind of T-shaped employees, right? So they're really good at one specific thing, but able to do a lot of different roles, right? So if you're a front-end person, they still should be able to do um, kind of the full engineering stack, contribute to the full engineering stack, which I think is more a making sure you're recruiting the right people onto your team at those early stages. That becomes less true at the kind of couple dozen person level, but for those first, you know, dozen engineers, I think that becomes becomes really important. So that's a that's a great point. Um, is there another silicon? Uh, sorry, go ahead. Just a quick, a quick yeah. mention. Once we're done with the Silicon Valley questions, if local folks asking questions would please press and hold the button on the microphone in front of you. That way, we can share that with our uh, folks in Silicon Valley. Okay. Thanks. All right. So it sounds like there's another Silicon Valley question, and then we'll come back to the room here as well. Go ahead. Is is there another question here? No, we're, we're fine. Okay. We'll hand it back. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. So go ahead, and then I think there's one in the back too. Go ahead. Okay. So how do you balance um, taking customer feedback with a product that um, they may not know that they want, or they may not know there's there's a need? For instance, when Apple first came out with their uh, with their iPod. Right, there were other MP3 players in the market. Sure. And uh, if they were to go to customers and say, "Hey, we have this new product. Um, do you want it?" Yeah. I mean, well, I already have an MP3 player. Like, how do yeah. you balance taking those that feedback versus what your vision is? Yeah. Um, right. So I think the point is that customers are really good at telling you about their problems. They're not really good at telling you about the right solutions to those problems. So to use your MP3 example or Right, people are really good at telling you um, about all the things that are frustrating with the way they listen to music today, um, like today or when Apple introduced the iPod. Um, what they're not good at often is envisioning what the solution to those problems look like. And so um, we didn't touch on it, again, because it's only an hour and a half with you all, but um, I think this is really, really important when you go out and do structured interviews with people. You really want to make sure before you start talking about your solution to the problem, that you spend meaningful time understanding who they are and how that maps to who you think your ideal customer is, and then just the problem state, right? So like, to use your iPod example, right? Is this somebody who listens to a lot of music? If not, maybe not a great person to get feedback from. If yes, okay, how do you do it today? You know, 
well, I listen to it and I've, you know, and people talk about all the different kind of ways that they hack making that work, right? All of that becomes really helpful. And then you can come in and interject your solution to this problem. Well, would this work better to solve those problems? And so um, when I'm sending entrepreneurs out to do these structured interviews or I do it myself, I will literally fold a piece of paper into thirds and force myself to take notes on each of those CPS steps before I get to the next one, right? So spend meaningful time talking about who the customer is and then meaningful time talking about what the problem is before I get to the solution stuff at all. Uh, so I think it's a great question and, and particularly relevant kind of at that fuzzy front end. Uh, yeah. I think they want you to push your button down too. Uh, in terms of getting the customer feedback on what they think about your product, yeah. uh, say Storyboard, uh, you ask them the questions, how do you achieve that in the demo video uh, to get the opinion of what the customers think about your product and what is the feedback on how you should uh, change uh, certain features of the product that you're en envisioning? Y yeah, so, so to me the customer interaction with the Storyboard versus the customer interaction with the video are different, right? So I wouldn't expect it to be the same in those two situations, right? If what you need feedback on is more like, is this a problem, right? I think you can often help people understand the problem very effectively using tools like storyboards. If what you hear when they say, yeah, I have that problem, but there's plenty of things that solve that already today, then maybe you need to help, and this kind of comes to the iPod question as well, maybe you need to help them imagine what a much better way to share files is. And I think that's a different customer interaction with a different set of validated learning that you're looking for. Does that make sense? Uh, suppose you've pitched a solution then to a customer, this is how I envision the product to be. Through a video, how do you get the feedback from them on whether Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so how the demo videos typically work is there's typically a clear call to action at the beginning and the end to request an invitation to private access to that product. So to be like beta at yourcompany.com, like beta at dropbox, get dropbox.com, um, right? And then you can interact with them over email afterwards, right? So there's typically, that's just typically some kind of call to action at the beginning or, or the end. That's a great point. Yes? Oh, they want you to push the button again. Sorry. I'm yeah, thanks. I'll get this still, I promise, right, to the sorry. group. No, go ahead. Is, is this better? Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Um, so if I were to go to a professional conference and I have a, a, an opportunity to demonstrate something and, and some of my software works just fine, some of it is, like you were saying, the Wizard of Oz, yeah. right? And I want feedback from these professionals I'm not doing it one on one, but how would I get the kind of feedback that you're suggesting in that venue, in that kind of a venue? Yeah, um, so I'll give you two answers, two answers to kind of top of mind on that. So one is I'm not sure Wizard of Oz is great in a keynote kind of style thing, but I do think in keynotes there are very effective ways to actually get people to raise their hand and tell you about the problems that you hypothesize those professionals have. Um, I think it's actually something that we did pretty well at MSpoke. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money for marketing, so I did a lot of public speaking and blogging and things like that to kind of generally talk about these things, which is a great way to get the right people, the sort of innovators and early adopters, to raise their hand. Um, to your, the other point though, in terms of how do you do Wizard of Oz in settings like that, um, this is actually, I'm stealing uh, liberally from Dave on this, but um, he used this at IndustryNet um, and then we sort of, uh, I've sort of stolen it from him since then. Like they would actually get suites at the conference and you can simulate a lot of that interaction kind of one-on-one. -on -one. And the great thing about suites at the conference right, is you can have like two breakfasts, two lunches, early drinks and dinner, right? So you can end up having a bunch of people come through one-on-one -on -one and interact with them. And you could certainly have someone behind the curtain helping with your demos in a setting like that, right? But I don't think you can do one to group in a conference setting because I think it's awfully hard to control. Like typically the labor involved in the Wizard of Oz is, is kind of implicitly non-scalable labor. Like, right, if you think about legal software, like we wouldn't want to 
just scale up the number of paralegals we have to solve this problem for people that that would be kind of not compelling. So for probably a demo would be better. Yeah. Because I'm imagining or a video. You know, the curtains and then a group of people will show up and then you give some sort of a demo. Yeah, or a video. You could do a little video on it. A video demo. Yeah, yeah not real not yeah. live. Sure. Yeah. Uh, could you comment on uh, like hardware development, how it ties in, because like you have lead times, PC fab, and that's yep. not as quick as software. Yep. Um, so yeah. So I think elements of this work really well for hardware startups, and others don't. Um, is it so specifically in the B two C hardware space? I actually find Kickstarter to be amazing. Right. The number of hardware products that are business to consumer that have gotten incredible customer validation using Kickstarter, which is effectively a community of early adopters who are comfortable billing, bu buying products that they realize they may never get or that they'll probably get much later than they signed up for, is pretty incredible. Um, we're also seeing um, you know, around the country, but even here with Lab Gear, people using kind of 3D printers and things like that to do the equivalent of kind of non-scalable things early on to get feedback, even if it's not doesn't have the unit costs or the, the sort of implicit economies of scale that you want when you're doing it um, kind of in more typical production approaches. Uh, in the B2B environment, one of the things that, that we're observing a lot is that um, as there are more and more people doing hardware in the B2B space, one interesting thing is that customer contracts seem easier. I mean, it's never easy to get a contract, but seem easier to get in a B2B environment for a physical product even than it is for software. Like people kind of expect there to be commitment with long lead times and that kind of stuff when you're delivering them a physical product. Right. So an interesting technique I've seen a couple B2B hardware startups use recently is like, hey, I want to build this tool and I don't want to say too much about this, but I literally met with an entrepreneur last week that was really fascinating with this, right? He had this solution that worked in a number of different verticals, but was kind of more targeting kind of a horizontal type of person inside of the company. And what he did is he said, look, I want you to sign up and help me find three more, because if we get four people to sign up for this, then we'll be able to build it. And all four of you will get this pilot pricing. And that person went to a trade association of other people in other vertical industries who look like him and basically helped him sell the other three because he wanted it so much, which I thought was, was really interesting. And they seemed, and I per, my perception is part, at least partially because it was a physical product, everybody seemed really comfortable with like they're signing up and then it's going to take a while before they get the devices that do what they want. So I think one more question and then I think we, I did blow through my time, but one more question and then we're, we're out of here. So make it a, anybody have no more questions? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so me and the person that I'm working with starting the startup, we're both biological scientists who have no experience in software, business. We have no clue about yeah. any of that stuff. How important is it to go outside and bring people in who do have that expertise or are these things that, you know, you think anyone who ha is competent could learn how to do? Yeah, I think you can learn how to do them for sure. Uh, he's walking away right now, but if you turn around and give Dave, when he comes back, and give Dave your contact information, I'm sure he can help you uh, with that. That's sort of what the, yeah, back, back that way, Dave. But uh, he can help you with, I mean, that's sort of what Dave and Lenore have created here at, at CMU, which is, I think, part of what is, is fantastic. So I, I think you absolutely can learn it, and I think you, you'll, there's this interesting game of like telephone when you outsource that. So like, if you remember the game telephone when you were like kids, my, my kids are, are young, they like playing this right now. Like you say something and you, they whispers around the room by the time it gets to the last kid, it sounds completely different than when it started, right? So to me, the risk with outsourcing this is that you're effectively adding people to that chain of communication. Whereas what's much more interesting to me is somebody like you and your co-founder who actually know what's possible and know what isn't possible out having those interactions 
so that you're as close to the person communicating as possible. And I think these workshops that Dave does and the center that Dave and Lenora run, right, we, they can help you, got, you guys learn those skills. So. Super. Um, thank you, Sean. Let's give him a great big hand. Um, we have a tradition. I know some of you may have to go, so in a second you can go. But we have a tradition that either the beginning or the end of these Connects events, we let people get connected. And we do that in two ways. If you have a startup and you're looking for talent, you can stand up and you can pitch your company and the things that you need. Or if you're talent looking to work at a startup or a project, you can do that. So if anybody wants to stay and pitch, stay. If you have to leave right now because we know everybody's on a schedule, you can head out right now, okay? So... While they do that, if you want to stay and pitch your company to the other folks that are here, please do that. For the rest of you, scramola. Uh, 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 Dave, this is Ravi from uh, from Silicon Valley. Hey, buddy, I just wanted to thank uh, thank um, uh, Amir for this talk, and I think uh, we're going to lose our room here. So uh, thank you very much from Good. Silicon Valley. Thank you. Take okay. care. Bye bye. bye. Oh, Silicon Valley just left. This is a great experiment. This is the first time we've done Oh, okay. And I think it's kind of fun. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. That's really cool. The first one. I can't pick on you. You guys pitch your talent. Hey, Matt, how you doing, buddy?